GoldenEye N64 has a lot to answer for. When you think about what that game did for this industry, proving FPS games can be smash hits on consoles is definitely its big thing, but it also proved licensed movie tie-in games can be smash hits too, and so in the early 2000s, arguably in direct response, the market flooded with licensed games, for better or worse. Probably worse. Publishers were on the hunt to snatch up all the biggest Hollywood IPs, and movie studios were keen to make money off of their films too, in some cases delving real deep into their catalogues. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, that studio with the lion that Amazon bought last year, delved deeper than most after GoldenEye, probably because they were the 007 movie studio, and so they greenlit some very amusing things. A Platoon RTS game on PC, I know, uh, a couple of Rocky Balboa fighting games, an infamously bad Robocop FPS game, a whole bunch of fairly solid 007 games, and curiously for the 40th anniversary of the film, The Great Escape got something of a third-person stealth game on PC, Xbox, and PS2 in 2003. A studio named Pivotal Games took on the task of making this thing who'd only opened their doors a few years earlier in the UK and had a surprise hit in 2002 with their first game, Conflict Desert Storm, a game that kicked off a series of tactical squad-based shooters. And so, with their next game being The Great Escape, it has all the quirks and stylings of an early 2000s squad shooter. The way the character moves, the big open maps with AI patrolling around, the blend of stealth shootouts and vehicles, the way it limits you to a handful of saves per level, it all feels lifted from Conflict Desert Storm and rearranged in a more linear way that tries to retell the story of The Great Escape. Which makes it a lot weirder and a little more cerebral than you might expect. There's no immediately clear framework or genre that you can plug a film like The Great Escape into. Like, 007 translates well enough to an FPS, and as much as an FPS starring Steve McQueen sounds amazing, it's hard to see it working here. So what Pivotal did was mash a few genres together. Usually, it's a stealth game. Uh, Hideo Kojima often brings up The Great Escape as a major inspiration for Metal Gear, the sneaking around an enemy base, avoiding searchlights, crawling through tunnels, sneaking past patrols, it's all very Great Escape, so it's only fitting then that the Great Escape game clearly draws from Metal Gear Solid. It's all very clunky, you play through missions one by one, each mission has a series of objectives to solve, and you play as a different character from the film, depending on the mission, where it could be a Metal Gear solid -y stealth mission, or a shootout, or driving, or an on-foot escape sequence. Or you'll get a mix of everything when the game does just go full Conflict Desert Storm with it. Like in one mission which has you sneaking around an enemy airbase. Uh, in the film this is a super brief scene where a couple of characters steal a plane, but here it's been elaborated upon where you gotta refuel the plane and figure out how to start it. Like, movie tie-in games do this extreme extrapolation thing all the time, and this is no exception. And here you're choking out enemies one by one from behind like a predator, you steal and wear one of their uniforms Hitman style, there's multiple vehicles you can drive around the base, it, it's like this big, violent, open sandbox level like you'd find in Conflict, but then in another mission, for example, it'll, it'll just be a super scripted chase where you're running through corridors and jumping between rooftops. Every mission really is a bit of a lucky dip. There was a moment early on in the game where I climbed out of a tunnel and just absent-mindedly covered its entrance back up with a wooden crate, and when I was about to leave the hut I was in, a guard opened the door for a surprise inspection. It wasn't a cutscene, it wasn't prefaced with a line of dialogue, it was instead this tense, unexpected moment where I had to stand completely still because the guard asked me to while they inspected every room. Good thing I covered up the tunnel, or it would have been a game over. Being fully in control in this scene added a real layer of intensity. There's that feeling that if I made one wrong move, it's over. And while this small moment isn't a mind-blowing stroke of game design mastery, I think it's a good example of something this game does really well. Later on, there's a train level which ends with shootouts on top of the carriages. Eat your heart out, Uncharted 2. Uh, again, in the film, this is a fairly simple scene where the characters just sort of walk to the back of the train and jump out, but you gotta make a game somehow. 
at the start of the level, before the chaos breaks out, you're issuing follow and stay commands to Blythe, who you might remember as the blind character in the film. You need to hide from a patrol that's making its way up and down the train, and to do so, you gotta hide yourself and Blythe in a carriage bathroom. The game doesn't explicitly tell you that that's what you have to do, even if it's fairly obvious, and when the patrol comes past, it's it's not a cutscene, and it doesn't cut away from gameplay as you rush into hiding and peek out the bathroom door keyhole, waiting for them to leave. There's just a lot of very well executed, suspenseful little nuggets of game design like this throughout where you're rewarded for keeping your cool or figuring things out for yourself. Like maybe you need to figure out how to distract a guard to steal something from under their nose or just how to get to the end of a level. There's one moment where you're in civilian clothes trying not to stand out in a train station and a guard pulls you up after you buy a ticket. For a moment the game has you thinking that you're caught and it's all over and you might try and run for the end of the level then and there, but if you keep a level head, the guard reminds you to pick up your change from buying the ticket. Close one. Most objectives are excuses for you to sneak back and forth around a map, usually a prison camp. They're effectively a whole lot of fetch quests. Like in the film where a character asks for rope and gets it immediately, the game has you sneaking into the guard's quarters to steal it for them. And where cheap stealth games often fall into the trap of being sort of a glorified stop and go traffic sign, go when the enemy's facing the other way, hide when they're looking, The Great Escape, with its levels being more open, does well to avoid this issue because you can usually just find another way around. Just go around the other side of the building if a guard is coming. It's still typical line of sight stealth, but it's a bit smarter about it. And then there's the shootouts, which are frankly very clunky, but if you can put up with them, they're not terribly frustrating. The clunkiness almost feels intentional because the difficulty is quite balanced because of it, and the shootouts happen so sparingly that when you are thrown into one, it's exciting to finally have the upper hand. And like a lot of this game, the combat is very hands-off. It makes you feel a bit clever when you find a great piece of cover or high ground. Uh, a later mission has you shooting your way through a small town, and it's very much about playing the percentages by climbing up to second story windows or flanking around buildings when you can. Uh, Pivotal's tactical shooter roots really come into play here, and the problem solving in this game is usually very instinctive and logical, and the shootouts are no exception. If it sounds like I'm being over positive and overly praising what is clearly a clunky, dated, cheaply put together game, you're not entirely wrong. This is by no means a great game on balance, don't get me wrong, and we'll get into why, but there's something about the way it carries itself. With how this reviewed and looked, it's hard to expect anything from it, but instead this is secretly a game that's at least aiming to be something far more than your usual early 2000s licensed cash-in. It's bold, it tries to balance a lot of different ideas, and it has real high points. It's cool too that the levels here are mostly these big open NPC filled realistically designed locations with guards patrolling or prisoners and civilians roaming around. There's flashes where it feels like a Hitman game, especially with the disguises. So to bring it back down to earth, there's some drawbacks. The AI here are ridiculous. They'll struggle to find you in a room that they see you enter. They'll stand still and gladly receive your bullets, though granted so will you because these controls are so bad. Uh, and if you're caught sneaking, they'll endlessly chase you around the map without shooting you unless you actually attack them first. If you stop, they'll arrest you, but you can literally just run around in circles Benny Hill style being chased forever. Also, this is a great escape video game and there's something really amusing about such a polished, precisely put together, well-known film having this sort of sloppy, janky video game to match 40 years later. The specific ways in which it adapts the film are equally amusing. You, you get some early 2000s video game cutscene recreations of certain scenes, the theme song plays a lot, which is great, and out of everyone in the movie, only Steve McQueen's likeness is here. Like, I guess if you could only get one actor, he's the one you'd get. Uh, his dialogue, unlike everyone else's, is ripped straight from the film. He simply gives one or two word answers to all the other characters who are clearly using more modern microphones and have more to say. Are you ready, Hills? Yeah. There is a small clump of bushes a few yards from the tunnel entrance. Head for them. They did Steve McQueen real dirty. Like, look at him. The, the googly eyes in this game are off the charts. 
Because McQueen's the only one that you recognize, if you're not super familiar with the film, it can sort of be a lot harder to discern who everyone else is even meant to be. Like if you side by side the actors with their video game counterparts, they're nothing alike. Which leads to a broader issue that this game has in that this is a very confusing retelling. It relies entirely on assuming you know the film well because on its own it just seems like a random collection of escape missions strung together. If you remember, the film was set in a single camp that imprisoned a whole bunch of different escape artists who had lots of prior escape attempts, so at the start of this game you play through a handful of those attempts that were off screen in the film, and it does quickly get a bit tedious seeing the same style of prison camp over and over early on, just sneaking back and forth doing fetch quests. The ending of the game is as goofy as the rest of it is, because every escapee actually escapes, which wasn't the case in the film or in real life because this was kind of a true story. So you get a scene where in the film a couple of characters are trying to escape in a plane but it runs out of fuel and they crash, but in the game the fuel gauge hits empty, they just flick it a couple of times and the gauge readjusts to show that they have plenty of fuel so they fly away into the distance. Or for a more well-known example, Steve McQueen actually manages to jump over that second fence in the game and right away. Why not I guess, it's, it's a bit of a cute fan servicey twist. It wouldn't be a great escape video game without that motorbike chase, and my god the final bike missions here are just distilled crummy video game chaos. The, the controls are whack, the bikes are constantly bouncing off slight angles, the AI is always harassing you and they're glitching out everywhere, there's early ragdoll physics that are very much on display. You have this kick to the side you can do, which is borderline useless. There's planes flying over and tanks everywhere and explosions going off. It, it, it comes across as the most janky, frustrating, thrown together way that this mission could have ever been made. It's, it's an amazing spectacle because of that. And it's very funny that one of the most iconic movie scenes in history has been adapted so poorly. You'd think that this is the one scene that they'd really want to nail, but instead we get pure budget game pandemonium. It, it's really hard not to love how bad it is now, in a way, but imagine buying this game on release at full price and getting this. This game is clearly very unpolished, and you can pick it apart from plenty of different angles because its weaknesses are very plainly on display. There's difficulty spikes and repetition and glitches, but the biggest problem with the game is how there's virtually always only one solution to every puzzle. When you do the exact thing the game expects you to, like hiding in the bathroom and waiting for the guards to walk past, it's great and it's rewarding your instinctive common sense behaviour, but as soon as you try something off script, it all falls apart. Like one time I had to steal something from under someone's nose and this game has heaps of choking people out from behind so naturally that's what I tried to do, but I kept getting caught every time I tried. It wouldn't let me do it. Uh, I had to turn off the radio in another room to distract him because that's what the game wanted me to do. Uh, or another time I just tried to blast past a checkpoint in a truck because the vehicles in this game are normally very durable, but the truck would just arbitrarily explode if I did so because the game wanted me to stop and show the guards my papers instead. The train top shootout annoys me a bit. Like. There's a carriage where you find guns, and once you pick up the guns, a guard unexpectedly comes in and you'll probably get caught, which kicks off the firefight. Fair enough, but you can actually hide from this guard and you won't get caught, but once you climb up to the roof, the firefight, much to my disappointment, happens anyway, even though you never got caught. There's no avoiding it. Uh, when the game's at its best, you're instinctively doing what it expects you to do, but if you push outside its boundaries, the illusion fades away. It, it leaves the feeling that a lot of potential went untapped. It's daring enough to dabble in a more hands-off sandboxy design, but it stops short of taking it far enough. Which isn't unexpected for a game that's trying to be so many different things at once, which at the end of the day is exactly why The Great Escape the Game is so compelling. And amazingly, this game's entire internal design document and many other behind the scenes PDFs like dialogue scripts, cutscene guides and stat guides have all been uploaded for educational reasons to a website called Scribed 
by the game's lead designer Thomas Rawlings. It's really rare and fantastic to see these behind the scenes insights. Being a design document for a later build of the game, it mostly reflects what actually made it into the final build and outlines how the game works from the back end. But reading between the lines a bit, you can speculate, and a lot of this will only be speculation, uh, but you can speculate on how the game was indeed trying to take its ideas further. Uh, the more recent updates to the changelog outline concepts that were removed from the game. For example, climbing was a big part of the game, but it was removed because players could get into unintended places too easily. Uh, and you could at some point choose which character that you wanted to play for each mission, or at least for some missions, where each character has different skills that could have perhaps been used to complete objectives differently, like lockpicking, pickpocketing, speaking German, that sort of thing. The disguise system was meant to be a lot more in depth too. Uh, as it is in the game, you basically just put on a disguise when the game expects you to, and the guards more or less ignore your behaviour while you're disguised. But at some point there was a system planned where you had to actually salute officers at a higher rank than your disguise, and if you didn't salute or you saluted the same officer twice, they'd catch you. It's a really sort of interesting idea. and. Maybe this system wasn't enjoyable at all in practice, who knows, but I think it speaks further to the game's inventiveness and ambition. The Great Escape the game takes a pretty big swing at it. It's, it's a resourceful game with enough neat, charming, and imaginative moments from start to finish to pull you through, but as it goes with a lot of games I like to cover, you gotta put up with a lot to find the things to appreciate, and if you can't put up with it, you'll probably think that this game is terrible. I also think this now serves as a nice reminder of the less hand-holdy design philosophies a lot of bigger games used to follow. It's not cryptic by any means, but by not telling you exactly how to complete all its objectives, it's more satisfying when you do, and the tiny cult following that this game has, by which I mean the few dozen comments you'll find on YouTube long plays of the game that call it underrated, bring this point up a lot. It's a lot of show, don't tell. You wouldn't say that this does the film justice, and it's not an easy one to recommend, but The Great Escape is, at worst, a very interesting adaptation. For a game that was quietly released and quickly forgotten, it's far more daring than that would suggest, and for that, The Great Escape the game deserves to be remembered not only as a janky, quirky, of its time retelling of the film, but also as a game that aimed to be something more.